So we are talking about uh, phase coherence. That was one lecture. And the second lecture was on quantum criticality in the Bose-Hubbard model. Okay, so go ahead. I'm what sorry. are some things that, uh, even some things that you really enjoyed hearing and then also questions. Okay, go ahead, Brad. All right, so for the phase coherence, I understand how you need the phase coherence to make a long range order, but why does it spontaneously break the symmetry? Like why does, is, how does that minimize the free energy if they're all in the same momentum state? Even if they're in different phases, shouldn't they have the same free energy? Okay. So the short answer is they all, all the possible minima have the same energy. It's like the Ising model. There were two minima and spontaneously, that's the word that basically means there's some random fluctuation which picks one of them. And then because there's a big barrier to flip to another one, it, um, uh, at least in the Ising model, there's a big barrier. Now for a continuous symmetry, that's, you don't have such a big barrier. So you can make these uh, uh, azimuthal uh, excitations and those are exactly the Goldstone modes, the long wavelength modes that you can excite. Okay, I'll keep writing questions because you know in the beginning, lots, these are very good questions. And if we don't get to all of them, I will address them as, uh, in more detail. But yeah, these are very good questions. So keep going. Um, sorry, I have a related question. So, um, so you said that the Goldstone boson for the BEC is phonon. Uh, so I just don't understand why it's phonon because when we think about phonon, we think it's the vibration of lattice. But now um, for BEC, I'm not sure the phonon is the vibration of what. Okay, um, it's just a word that is used. Basically, uh, phonons have a linear dispersion with uh, omega goes like k, c, k. And here also the excitations go like c, k. Okay, so it's called quote unquote phonon. But that's why in my notes, I have written elastic vibrations for the crystal. And here it's just the, vibra it's the vibrations of the phase. So, it's it's just called a goldstone mode if you don't like phonon. Okay. Because it has the same dispersion, uh, that's the term used. And one thing to point out here is that if you have um, charge, um, like uh, uh, in a superconductor, this goldstone mode gets gapped, and uh, that's uh, the called the Anderson Higgs mechanism by which. Uh, the gap it translates into a mass, and uh, that's uh, that's called the Anderson-Higgs mechanism for acquiring mass. And this is a very big thing in high energy physics. It's the Higgs mechanism, what's called the Higgs mechanism, by which everything acquires mass. So we didn't go into that because our systems were neutral, and uh, this mode it indeed uh, goes to zero at long wavelengths. Okay, keep going with more questions. So I had a question about dimensionality. Uh, the the systems that you're drawing in the uh, uh, the, uh, the whole what is the dimensionality of the system? Is it is it in three D or is it in two D? Uh, I understand that the spins are in two D. So so n is equal to two because because it's a two component order parameter. But I I am not sure about the dimensionality of the system because I think. Uh, you can't have B season 2D, uh, Malmin Wagner theorem or something. Right, right. Okay, very good. So, um, the dimensionality of the spin is indeed 2D, it's O2. The dimensionality of space, let's start with say D equal to three, where there are like no complications. So in D spatial, three spatial dimensions, you would have off diagonal long range order at finite temperatures, as well as at zero temperature. Okay, so that's the story with D equal to three. At D equal to two, you would have no off diagonal long range order at finite temperatures. It's that 
a costless towelless physics we talked about, but at zero temperature. In the Bose Hubbard model, for example, at zero temperature, this maps to a D plus Z kind of a quant classical model or a D plus one classical model. So two space model becomes effectively a 3D model and it will now have off diagonal long range order. In one dimension, there's no long range order in, at finite temperatures, but at zero temperature, one dimensional space will map into, let's say one plus one dimensional quantum model. And that will now have a KT physics in space and time. So these vortices will actually be space-time objects. Okay, very nice questions. Let's so, keep going. So uh, uh, um, what will happen if we are looking at an O3 model? So we will have two phase variables or something like that? Yeah. Okay. You will have two transverse directions to look at. Yeah, we haven't discussed that in as much detail. Uh, it has different... Uh, excitations, I say that in a table, hedgehogs and so on, skirmions, hedgehogs, and so on, yeah. Yeah, okay, more questions. So again, I might combine, I'm giving very quick answers right now, just to pique your interest, but I will probably combine all of this into a recording later on. Okay, this is a good time for more questions, please. Um, so for the Bose Hubbard model, when you're moving along the contour, uh, the equal equal um, density contour, let's say the n equals one contour, as soon as you reach that uh, the peak, the tip of the mot lobe, the phase transition now becomes instead of singular it, or instead of a divergence, it becomes a cusp. So as you move across, let's say you're just moving along that. Oh, no, no. Uh, it's not a cusp. Oh, it's it's a divergence. Okay, okay. So then it's as you move along the... Everywhere. On that whole line, it's a divergence. The okay. exponents change. Okay. The universality class of the exponents change. So then when you move along that contour, then is it just like a jump change as you go to that point and then pass it? Um, no, it's not a jump change. Uh, so you, depending on how you, you're cutting it in different ways and mm -hmm. whatever quantity you're looking at will diverge. If you mm -hmm. try to fit the divergence with exponents mm -hmm. at the tip of the lobe, it will fit a D plus one X, Y model exponents. Mm -hmm. Away from that, it will fit the so-called generic or mean field exponents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And you can see that in simulations. In experiments, so the only experiments you can really do are the cold atom experiments, but they don't have that kind of refinement, uh, refined data to see exponents as clearly. But in simulations, you can. So how do you, let's say numerically or experimentally, how do you exactly probe that point? Um, you just do a simulation at a fixed density. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a, you ha do a simulation at a fixed density and you change hopping over U. <clears throat> okay, so uh, you're not keeping chemical potential fixed. If you just pick your chemical potential at some arbitrary point within the MOT lobe, the density is always one. But when you hit the boundary, the density for, a for that fixed chemical potential, you won't be able to keep it at um, density of one. It'll either be above one or below one, depending on whether you're above the mot tip or below it. Mm -hmm. But in a simulation, you can fix your density and then look at uh, various, uh, like for example, you can look at superfluid stiffness or the order parameter and they will have different exponents. Mm, okay. A good place, a good resource, I have I put a book chapter that I uh, wrote with two of my collaborators. I have put that in the um, resources. Let's okay. have some discussion about, and also other people's references and so on. Yeah. I, 
I actually had a related question. So, mm -hmm. uh, how important is particle hole symmetry for that mod flow? So, can I say that oh, if I break particle? Totally, totally important. It is that, important. That point has that special particle hole symmetry, which is why it is in a different universality class. And and that particle hole symmetry comes because of the underlying dispersion. Because I'm starting with a, a dispersion that is particle hole symmetric. So I guess what I'm saying is that if I start with some arbitrary dispersion that is particle hole asymmetric, can I say that the mod loop will not be symmetrical? It will be some uh, something else, but it will still have the same universality class. Or uh, if you have like an emergent symmetry, you know, again, if uh, RG will work with uh, irrelevant variables becoming, uh, you know, it'll shed those. And if your critical point ends up having emergent particle hole symmetry, it will re regain these um, exponents. And this emergent particle hole symmetry uh, uh, can be tuned via the, so I guess what I'm saying is that, let's say instead of having some, uh, like a square lattice or something, I change the lattice and I change the dispersion such that I don't have uh, particle hole symmetry anymore in the underlying dispersion. So will that change the unit so uh, the question so there are two questions one is whether the mod lobe is going to just change from what you have shown right now to just to changes the, the tip becomes up or down depending on where the uh, half filling is and and the second question is does it does the tip of the mod lobe still have the same universality class or yeah so again, uh, it will depend. So the mod loop changing uh, where it is, uh, mm. is um, not uh, very critical, right? It could, shouldn't yeah. say critical. It, it's not very important, right? It could okay. move anywhere. It's the symmetry around that point. So okay. again, if there are, let's say a triangular lattice, if that is a relevant perturbation, okay. then, uh, then um, it will change the universality class. It's a good yeah. question. I don't know the answer whether on a triangular lattice, it could be that a triangular lattices um, could create problems because you, know, you can get frustration and so on on a triangular lattice. So um, yeah. I don't know the answer off the top whether this, I think it could be a relevant perturbation. I would okay. have to look a little bit on that. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, uh, to a large extent, once you start putting in perturbation, um, sorry, frustration mm -hmm. in the Bose Hubbard model, um, it will start having an impact. It's a relevant direction. Okay. And qualitatively, what you are trying to, what is happening is that the many body wave function of the bosonic system. Uh, we talked about this, that it has no nodes. nodes. It can never be negative. Yeah. And uh, what starts to happen is if you have frustration, you can get negative, uh, behave, negative uh, paths to the wave function. Okay. Okay, this is uh, like a bigger story, actually. Okay, more questions or should I move a bit? Any other burning questions? Uh, One more. Not anymore. Let me um, go to another uh, part. So I'm um, going to share another screen. Okay. And uh, I think Brad had another question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so for the expectation value of psi, when we are in a um, fixed end state that was zero. What, what was wrong with that argument? Oh, psi is a destruction operator. So it will act on a state with n particles and make it n minus one. And now you have a state with n minus one overlap with the state of n particles and that overlap is zero. These well, I know. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that, but with that same system, if you partition it, you showed that it was equal to something non-zero. Yeah. And, and 
Yeah, and that's because you're allowing a subsystem to be in a grand canonical ensemble. And uh, these subsystems can have a fixed phase. And then you can look at whether the, that fixed phase is identical to the phase in some other subvolume far away. So everything is macroscopic. It's a bit like, um, you know, you can have a micro canonical ensemble with a fixed energy, but you can still talk about temperature fluctuations within each subvolume, which is able to exchange energy with the neighbors. So, yeah. Okay, we, sh we can talk more about it. We can definitely talk more about it later. But uh, these are, you know, at the core, these, that's why discussion is very useful because these ideas are really, um, um, it takes some time to, to get it into our, our system because it's not like just grand canonical system. It's also the phase coherence that is being developed. So let's continue to talk about it, but let's do it in the following way. Let me, I'm coming now to uh, trying to review the, the course. Let me see, are you guys um, able to see my new screen? Which is here. No, we can. Okay, good. Uh, so, what I want to do is actually, rather than going through it, because you all have it before you, I again want to pose a question and then in the context of phase coherence, discuss it. So I'm going to show you, um, ultimately I'm thinking, what are some things you will take away from the course? So that motivated me to put together, um, I'm going to write two such overview lectures, one on classical critical phenomena and the other on quantum critical phenomena. So broadly, I'm touching on the major paradigm under which we understand uh, phases and phase transitions. And uh, as far as phase transition con transitions are concerned, we even have to go beyond the Landau, um, be, uh, Landau free energy uh, be, uh, functional. So um, in the Landau paradigm, the first thing is we talk about phases. And these phases can be described by a local order parameter. So that's the main one key idea to take away. What that local order parameter is depends on uh, symmetries. And we talked about three different symmetries in the course, Ising, um, XY, and to some extent, Heisenberg. Okay, this is useful to keep in mind because when we study, do some research today, a lot of the focus, for example, in my group is uh, on systems where you have a new kind of phase that does not uh, uh, allow for a local order parameter. And yet there is a more global way of defining the characteristics of that phase. But this forms the paradigm for what we have learned so far uh, in terms of classifying phases. Okay, the next thing about, uh, about these order parameters is that as you raise the temperature, there is uh, the order parameter which tracks the degree of order in the system decreases, finally vanishes at TC. And it vanishes with some exponent beta. And we have talked about this at length in the course but I wanted to bring out one key thing that um, what is underlying, why are we interested in these exponents? The first thing is because something dramatic happens at that temperature. It's not like your order parameter decreased and had a blah behavior, you know, some kind of decrease and then it's going on and on and becoming small, something sharp. And that's very interesting that there's something very sharp at that transition, at least in the thermodynamic limit. On any finite system, you will start to see through a susceptibility. So it's useful then not to look at the order parameter, but the susceptibility of this order parameter. Or you can look at correlations and they show a sharp peak at the transition. And in, even if your system is not infinite, you will see a enhanced peak 
it won't be singular and divergent. Okay, so that's the second thing to keep in mind. And the last thing, the reason we are so interested in this and the reason we paid so much uh, attention to one model, you might say, why did we do that limitation of just one model that we beat to death in so many different ways? Because um, underlying all this is the idea of universality. So one model is not enough, but if you pick a model which has uh, th that particular symmetry uh, and study it in different dimensions, you learn about all the physics uh, around that, at least at the critical point. So that's not to say that behavior away from the critical point is not important, but our goal in this course was to highlight the universality. And uh, so that's what we did. And the, I want to bring out one or two features about why the behavior was universal. The key thing is that there was a length scale that we call the correlation length that diverged. As a result, all the details become irrelevant. And uh, we uh, saw that through, um, um, through, this, uh, through Wilson's idea of RG. So this is another thing you learned. Uh, typically in quantum mechanics, you have done some, uh, you know, you have a Hamiltonian, you treat something as H0, the other one is perturbation, um, and you can look at small perturbations around H0. In uh, statistical mechanics, you have done things like uh, low temperature and high temperature expansion, and all of these are going to miss the transition. So the main part here was to show you what was Wilson's extremely powerful idea of RG, which was a completely different idea. His point was if something is universal, we have to not look at one model. We have to look at that model in the space of Hamiltonians in infinite dimensional Hamiltonian space, and then look at how the couplings in that Hamiltonian flow under coarse graining. And the most important kind of coarse graining, the one with the greatest impact, was to look at it in momentum scale and start integrating out high momenta, which is essentially saying small length scales. So you're getting rid of irrelevant small scale physics and trying to go toward large scale physics or small momentum physics. So again, we saw a lot of examples of this. We saw, uh, talked about uh, these um, renormalization group uh, transformation, R, which takes you from one coupling to the coupling at the next scale. And we talked about fixed points that don't flow. So under fix, uh, if you have a fixed point K star under RG, it remains fixed. That's why it's called a fixed point. And there are two types of fixed points. The critical fixed point, where the correlation length is infinite and the trivial fixed points. And we talked about this kind of picture you, you might want to keep in mind. You have your couplings, the K1 is uh, one axis here and K tilde is all the other couplings and there is a critical fixed point um, and an entire manifold, critical manifold on which C is infinite. Now, uh, come two key points about uh, relevant and irrelevant directions. So if you look at flows near it, you saw that if it was a relevant direction, the flows went away from that critical fixed point. The reason we call it relevant because, is because that parameter, usually it's the temperature, you have to tune very precisely to be at the critical fixed point. If it's something like next neighbor interactions, you can be more lax about it. You don't need to tune it very precisely. That's why we, we use this nomenclature. But in any case, the relevant direction then takes you toward these, um, towards these trivial fixed points. And the irrelevant ones will make you flow. If you're on that manifold, it'll make you flow toward the critical fixed point. So bottom line, the way you flow, the rate at which you flow, then determines the exponents, okay? So uh, you won't remember too much of this later on, but keep this kind of big picture in mind. And I want you to keep these 
ideas in your mind because in a way, these RG ideas, regardless of whether you may use RG in your specific research, they are always there in the mind of a physicist. If you work on a model and somebody says, um, is this model relevant for this material? The answer will be in a coarse grained way, we are going to look at that, that equality. It doesn't have to be a precise modeling. So in a way, RG will always be part of your, uh, kind of like your DNA kind of thing, your part of your physics DNA. So the RG flows then give you exponents and it also explains this larger puzzle of scaling behavior. So historically, this is how the, I didn't teach the course in a his, historical way, uh, primarily because um, it's like, you know, there's utter confusion when you do it historically. People make right turns, wrong turns, and so on. But everything fell in place once RG came into the picture. But RG didn't just get spawned in vacuum. All of the scaling behavior that was observed in experiments and that gave exponents that didn't agree with the mean field exponents sparked the questioning as to why was there this disconnect. And ultimately that was answered by RG. Furthermore, uh, you could take data uh, as a function of let's say two variables. This could be free energy, but you know, more generally we look at a more spiky quantity like susceptibility, uh, which depends on two quantities, say temperature and field, two relevant quantities. And as we saw in, um, uh, in our class and also in the project presentations, that this behavior as a function of two variables can be scaled as a function of a combination of a single variable. Again, with some exponent here and some exponent in the front. So going forward, you may not remember exactly what the exponents were. You can always look up the lecture notes and find tables and all of that, but keep in mind this one big picture of um, classical critical phenomena. Okay, so that's one overview piece I wanted you to hear. And um, I could take a few questions if you guys have something to discuss here, or I wanted to show you some data. Um, I finally managed to find, uh, it's been supremely hard to find good data on some of the concepts I have wanted to bring up. And I will show you that next. But let me see. Uh, perhaps this is not a bad time to take a few questions. Or you think this is a, a good reminder? I think maybe that's fine. This is a good reminder of um, uh, what, what is um, uh, what is a summary and that you should carry with you. Let me show another, uh, some of the data which I finally found. Um, and I've uh, uploaded the particular paper which was proved to be helpful for this. So, okay. I think you, you guys will find this fun because now uh, you have all the concepts under your belt and um, you know we can look at that. So I'm going to try to show as much as I have been able to find targeting real materials, trying to figure out uh, you know, which dimension they are in, how do you make low dimensional systems, what kinds of order parameter do they have, you know, what kinds of interactions, ferro, anti-ferro, the size of the spin, the range of the interactions, all of that. So let's see. Um, this, is, uh, this is theory first. I'm just, put, I'm, I'm putting all the results on for D equal to one, two, and three on the same plot. So what I wanted to show here was, um, the following few things. First of all, um, mean field behavior comes with a very sharp 
transition and then zero fluctuations above that. This is the specific heat as a function of temperature. And I've scaled it with the Curie Weiss temperature, which is just the coordination number times uh, J, the strength of the coupling. But one significant thing compared to the uh, behavior in say uh, 3D or 2D, you see that e there is a divergence, but uh, even above the divergence, you still see fluctuations. That's one thing. And second thing is that TC moves to lower temperatures as the dimensionality goes down. Uh, and this is not because the number of neighbors is going down. Your, uh, it's large, you can scale it with the number of neighbors, but it's because the fluctuations are increasing. And of course, you know that in 1D, which is that last plot here, uh, at that point, there is no transition. It's just a very uh, soft bump. That's just like a short key anomaly. So this I thought was useful to put on the same plot. Um, then, you know, now you look at data and that's the other thing I wanted to bring up that data is always going to be complicated. And um, so, you know, this is uh, iron chloride and it turns out you need some more, uh, um, you need some more analysis to see why it is an Ising magnet, but let's go with that. Uh, it, so that's the first question. What is the symmetry of the order parameter? So that has to be addressed. But nevertheless, no matter what the symmetry, what you see, uh, that would only impact the, the exponents at the transition. What you see is there's a second bump here, and then the specific heat rises at low temperatures. So I'm just alerting you to this, because if you are going to look at real data, you will have to contend with the fact that when you look at the specific heat, there are other things um, also contributing. For example, there'll be a lattice. So exactly those phonons that we talked about, uh, which are the goldstone modes of the lattice, they will contribute. And they contribute a T cubed specific heat, which rises with the temperature. So you have to remove that to see what is the magnetic part. Okay, now this further peak, turns out this material has a Heisenberg symmetry for the order parameter at high T, but there are some anisotropies in the system which make it an Ising uh, order parameter at low T. So this is another uh, wrinkle that there may be other interactions like anisotropic interactions, which will um, you know, contend, which will kind of compete with the magnetic interactions. And then you know, you have, that is what contributes to this peak here, which is kind of a transition. It's not a transition, it's sort of a crossover from Heisenberg fluctuations to Ising fluctuations. And ultimately, if you analyze the critical behavior at T around TC in a small window, then you do see Ising universality. So that's another interesting thing I wanted to bring up. Um, okay, so now comes the question of how do you create magnets in different dimensions? So I'll go through this quickly, but essentially um, your magnetic ion here is copper and you can put it, you know, Chemistry is a wonderful subject. I never liked it somehow when I was in school because I just found like it was so much stamp collecting and so much information, but it's uh, good to have friends who are chemists. And then, you know, you talk to them often and they, and you say, well, you know, is there a way you can make like a, just a isolated uh, mag, uh, spin or you can make a 1D chain or something and they come up with ways to do that. So if you have these chemist friends, they're very valuable. Uh, keep them close and learn from them. Uh, so this is some, and you know, don't try to pronounce all of these materials, but whatever it is, copper is the key actor. And as far as we are concerned, you can get materials or, or molecules where these two copper atoms are close by, but very far from everything else. So this would be an example of uh, two coppers interacting with some exchange interaction. And you can just, see, this is not going to have a phase transition, but you can learn about this, 
the strength of the exchange interaction just from the molecular uh, behavior. Okay, so this I call like zero D. Now comes um, 2D magnets, you can create them. So it turns out there is again some ammonia compound. Uh, that's kind of a, a parent compound. And what you can do, again, copper is the key actor. It's not, its distance is not very different from the molecule. So what you learned about J from the molecule translates into J here. But what you can do is insert, mm, so here are the copper layers. And here's the second copper layer. And depending on um, this formula, these acetate groups, you can insert non-magnetic stuff in between. And that way you can reduce the coupling in the C direction, in the perpendicular direction. So you can uh, engineer materials that have J prime over J that can become very small, depending on how many acetate layers you, you insert. Yeah, so these are interesting examples because ultimately we don't care where the 2D material comes from. We are fixated on the 2D material, but th these are the ways your chemist friend can make them for you. And another thing to point out, um, at temperatures above J prime, in this case, let's say 10 to the minus four of J, so you can get a temperature scale above which it will pretty much behave like a 2D uh, I system with whatever symmetry it has, but once you hit a temperature on the order of J prime, then the coupling will kick in and it will become a 3D uh, um, universality class. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, okay, this is um, another example where you can take a, a potassium nickel fluoride, nickel is the key actor, and again, you can insert um, non-magnetic layers, fluoride, potassium fluoride layers, and make 2D materials. So this is a classic Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which is rare, because usually if you have an isotropic symmetry, something will make it anisotropic, some anisotropy term. But this one is pretty much, a, 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 in fact, it's a, um, it's a, this is a, it's a Heisenberg antiferromagnet, but the spin is, uh, I think the spin is one here. You can go to the copper compound, uh, which is related, and this one has a spin of half. So the other important thing is the smaller the spin, the larger the quantum fluctuations. So if you want to look at quantum effects, you want to go toward these spin half materials. And this uh, lanthanum copper O4 is actually the parent compound for high, that goes superconducting when you do some uh, chemical tinkering. So magnetism forms the backdrop, not only for understanding magnetism, but as uh, for understanding uh, novel metallic and superconducting phenomena when you dope it, or when you do some quantum chemistry. Okay, now to come to 1D, Again, it's the same idea here. You have chains of materials and you reduce the coupling between the chains. And again, you know, through uh, the fact that these exchange, ultimately connections uh, between magnetic ions happen through exchange pathways. Quantum mechanically, what is happening? You know, we study classical models, but underlying the classical model, the mechanism by which you get magnetism is all quantum mechanical. So that quantum mechanical um, mechanism is exchange. When you exchange two electrons, you have to pick up these minus signs and that leads to these exchange interactions J that we have just lumped as a constant. That mechanism is a, a quantum mechanism. And you can kill certain pathways uh, by uh, putting in uh, like ammonia. Ammonia doesn't allow for very good overlap. And if you don't have overlap of wave functions, then you won't get exchange pathways. So that's an, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is kind of, um, you have the overview in mind, but I'm just kind of giving you some uh, bits of information on aspects of magnetism that were not, you, not 
I keep using the word critical, that were not essential for the course, uh, for the critical phenomena of the, of the transition, but they are important in the larger context. Okay, let's, um, so this is a, another useful way to tell how two dimensional is your system or how one dimensional is your system. And I won't go into this in detail, but bottom line, what it comes down to is we probe magnetic systems by, um, in different ways. We can look at the mag magnetic moment by using NMR, by using um, uh, these susceptibility measurements. But another way is you can use inelastic neutron scattering to see more than just the magnetization. You can see the excitations. Um, and if these excitations will have, these are like the goldstone modes of the magnet. So for example, the, these goldstone modes, um, because these are soft modes, right? You can create a, a mode, meaning you can have a mode which varies in momentum and it costs some energy. That plot of energy versus momentum, let's look at this, uh, this curve here, is called a dispersion relation for the magnons or the spin waves or the goldstone modes. Um, and the, these dispersion relations, the, the amount they disperse, meaning how much do they change between zero and the Brillouin zone, the, the longest wavelength and the shortest wavelength. What is the change in the energy? That gives you some, uh, that the, if that change in energy is very small, it basically means that in that direction, uh, you, you, are, you don't have much coupling. So that's another way to tell if you have 3D uh, modes or if you have a 3D system or a 2D system and how coupled it is and so on. Okay. Another crucial thing I want to point out is that and this is especially true for uh, experimentalists. When they take data, let's say you measure susceptibility as a function of temperature. So they'll typically have units of uh, one Kelvin uh, around a few Kelvin, or it may be hundreds of Kelvin, and they'll plot the data as a function of that real Kelvin scale. It's not useful. Okay, as a first piece of data, it is of course very useful, but don't stop there. That's what I want to say. Don't stop there and scale the data. Now you may say, well, I don't know what the coupling is. There are ways to find that coupling uh, by looking at high temperature behavior. So let's say you scale the data temperature over J and this is the susceptibility on the vertical axis. And what you find is you can look at many different materials. They are all spin half, quantum Heisenberg antiferromagnets involving copper, but the J's in them vary by a factor of 200, okay? And yet all the data can be scaled on the same plot. And the reason is the scale for T for the temperature is being set by J. So if you divide that obvious reason for the temperatures being very different, then the data can be scaled. So this is very important for analyzing data because then it takes away the mystery of this Kelvin versus paying attention to what are the actual features. Okay, and this here is uh, also fitted with uh, some theoretical work by Bonner and Fisher long back. Okay, now coming to the 2 d Ising model, which we have looked at in detail, what I've put here are the three curves, and this is thanks to the two groups that did the low temperature and high temperature expansions. Brad and Yanjun did the high temperature expansion. Saad and Sandeep did the low temperature expansion. And On Sagar, of course, got the exact solution. So we have all of that here. And the reason for putting this up is showing that, you know, there are, they clearly agree in the regions they should agree. Let's look at the specific heat, or, or before specific heat, let's look at say the entropy. And you can see in the entropy, the green is the exact behavior. The red is the high temperature, red for hot, 
it pretty much agrees on the high temperature side. This is beta here. So small beta is high temperature. Large beta is low temperature, and that's where the blue, blue for cold, agrees. And there's a little bit of disagreement around the transition. Now you could just you know, shrug it off and say, you know, my job is done. I can pretty much explain everything. And this is where I want to also alert you because in your own research, you will see this kind of thing. Knowing when to go after a puzzle is the big part of research. You can't go after every puzzle. So you have to know which puzzles are more important than others. And clearly the puzzle of the critical point is hugely important. And of course that shows up much more clearly if you take one more derivative and then you see very clearly that there is this huge X, uh, peak at the transition, which is missed by the, these expansions. Okay, now the data. So this is amazing data. And you know, you see that all of these papers are very old. This is 1967 data for cobalt cesium boride. So the other thing to appreciate in the course, I have distilled in one semester what took half a century of exploration. That's something to appreciate. You know, people worked for decades. This data was taken in the 60s. And imagine the questions that were driving them, and they continued to drive that without knowing what was behind all this, till On Sagar comes along and does his exact solution and look at the fit. So the one thing to appreciate here, it's very small temperature range around TC. TC of one, T over TC of one is the transition. And this is a log scale. So, you know, I showed you that very sharp peak in the specific heat that has been expanded by making a log scale. And you see how beautifully the data fits. It would have been nice if there was a mean field theory on this and you could have seen how badly that would fit. But this is the kind of uh, stuff that is very useful to catalog and to bring up in courses. It's just that these are hard to find because they are uh, you know, like all over the map and not tabulated somewhere. This is another material, cobalt cesium, Chloride, again, cobalt is the uh, main actor here. This is, again, an Ising uh, model, uh, a cubic Ising model, 3D. And now you can see uh, this is the theoretical calculations by these people. So this is not exact, but you can see it works very well. Um, okay. Uh, if you were to uh, ask why is cobalt acting like an Ising model, that requires quantum chemistry. And it requires quantum chemistry in droves. You can't just say this is what happens in the atom. You then have to put that atom in the crystal. And a lot of uh, the work in the center of emergent materials is on this kind of question, understanding all the interactions that go into defining even this order parameter symmetry. So, okay. I want to show you know, we have talked about mean field and generally we have kind of said, oh, mean field doesn't work because it neglects all the, the fluctuations. Unless you go above the upper critical dimension and oftentimes upper critical dimension is four. So who cares, right? But superconductivity, which is an amazing phenomenon, we haven't discussed it in class except to say that the order parameter for the superconductor is uh, the uh, same as the order parameter for the Bose system. And it is uh, like you had psi dagger was the order parameter for the Bose system. For the superconductor, it is um, psi is now a combination of two fermionic operators. So as far as critical phenomena is concerned, you don't care about mechanism. That's a very powerful aspect of critical phenomena. I don't need to know anything about Cooper, Cooper pairing, the BCS wave function. All I need to know is what is the order parameter symmetry, and that is O2. And then for reasons uh, of the coherence length being very, very large already in the system, 
um, it turns out that mean field theory works very well, even when you are in three dimensions. In two dimensions, you can have other things like vortices, but in three dimensions, and this is the data for that. So this is the order parameter of a superconductor. And uh, I'm not going into detail here, but it can be measured by tunneling. So there's a direct way to probe this. In the context of my lecture on phase coherence, what you are probing here is the amplitude of the order parameter, not the phase. But there has to be phase coherence for there to be a superconductor with zero resistance but that's not what is being probed in the left curve. It's just the order parameter, which vanishes at TC. And if you were to analyze the exponent, it would be half, the beta equal to half exponent. If you look at the specific heat, here is the, so the, the straight line, the linear slope line is the specific heat of, this is a particular metal, I think it may be, um, what could, this might be aluminum, I'm not sure. But aluminum has a, is a metal. And as, if it didn't go superconducting, a metal has a linear specific heat. And that's what you see here. So this is the linear specific heat of a metal coming from the Fermi C. We just talked about a solid, which was an insulator and phonons. That has a T cubed specific heat. We saw that. This is a metal with a Fermi surface, and you can get excitations at arbitrarily low energies around the Fermi surface. You get a linear specific heat. If you make uh, aluminum superconducting by cooling it, then you get this second plot here, which has an exponentially suppressed specific heat at low temperatures because there is now a gap in a superconductor. And then it rises above the normal specific heat, and then it has this jump. Because the mean field behavior of the specific heat is a jump in, in uh, C, in the specific heat. Now you might say, well, how come the same metal is both normal and superconducting? There are tricks you can play with a magnetic field where you can put, and I'm not going into that here, but you can add a tiny magnetic field. Um, this is a type one superconductor, so you can add a small magnetic field and drive it normal. So that's what you do here. You take aluminum at low temperatures, drive it normal in a tiny magnetic field. It doesn't upset the specific heat very much, and you can get this linear data. And then uh, you can take it without the magnetic field and get the superconducting data and get this behavior. So this is absolutely beautiful data. Um, and these are very difficult measurements because there's a large underlying background lattice specific heat as well, which has to be removed. Okay, but if somebody says, give an example of a phase transition that is mean field like, this is the one to quote. Okay, this is a table you can look at. I'm not, it's not fun to look at table over Zooms. But these tables are useful, you know, they catalog, they are all from um, Chaikin and Lubensky, but they catalog the exponents in for different, um, um, different um, order parameter symmetries and different dimensions. So I have all of that for different dimensions. Okay, um, I think uh, that was about it for this thing. Any questions on this? presentation. It's going to be, uh, uh, I just finished putting it, but I'll put it on, on our uh, course webpage so you can always take a look. Okay, so I think, uh, any questions there? Yeah, I, I had a question about the, the inelastic neutron scattering. So you said that you can look at the the magnon dispersion and tell whether the system has uh, like an isotropy along different axes. So uh, am I supposed to look at the slope or am I supposed to look at the end? Because both of them- You could just look at the bandwidth, uh, either the, the slope bandwidth. or the bandwidth, yeah. Bandwidth gives, uh, the bandwidth means the range of eigenvalue, uh, range of energies that uh, you get from very long wavelengths, so small k to large k. 
Okay, so the bandwidth is the one that decides the, the yeah. strength of interaction. Okay. Yeah, you can also look at the slope. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, sounds good. Um, let's do one thing. Let's take a short break. And uh, I want all of you to go to the SEI forms and please try to fill it up now. I'll give a break for about five minutes. And then uh, we, we come back to some more discussion. And uh, while you, uh, some of you may have already filled it up, so I'm going to put a YouTube movie because ultimately um, what we will carry with us, I told you that overview uh, of ideas I want you to carry with you, but you know, even that, may be hard to carry uh, in your mind. So a picture or a movie is something that is much easier to keep in mind. So while some of the others who have not filled out the SEI forms are working on their forms, I'm going to put this movie here. And this movie uh, comes from a video link that uh, I think Jay sh shared with me long back. I had been talking about um, talking about pictures describing the critical behavior near uh, at low temperatures, high temperatures, and criticality. And he sent me this absolutely beautiful video link. Uh, 